Terracotta Tefano o Aotearoa Unitarians. Terracotta na manahiri, no mai harmai. Harmai ki tene fare karakia ate atua. Terracotta tena tato katoa. Well, welcome to all from near and far to our virtual sanctuary. We live in a time where conspiracy theories are rampant. And that's kind of my focus for today. How do we know it's a conspiracy theory? Reason is an important tool, sure. An essential arbiter of truth claims about the world. But religion is grounded someplace deeper where we experience the joy of living and are connected intimately with all that is. Religion is an entirely human experience, but one that we get in touch with using some pathway other than intellectual argument. In religion, we seek to address not just what is, but also what we hope and what we dedicate ourselves to. We rely on it to navigate the shoals of love and grief, compassion and estrangement, gratitude and disappointment, and mystery and wonder. If you have a chalice or a candle you'd like to light at this time, I'm going to use a chalice lighting by a woman named Betts Weinecke, who passed away a few years ago. But it was her husband who brought me into the Unitarian Church in a formal way. So this is in honor of him. May this flame, symbol of transformation since time began, fire our curiosity, strengthen our wills, and sustain our courage as we seek what is good within and around us. As I mentioned last week, I'm using our time together to explore more broadly musical options for worship that we can't necessarily do when we meet in person because you either don't know the words or the tunes or whatever. So my opening song is called is hymn 354, We Laugh, We Cry. Well, I light a virtual candle for actually of joy for how most of us in Auckland are keeping to the rules, because it seems to be working as we seek once again to eliminate the virus from New Zealand. Uh, I know it's not easy for us, uh, unless you're like me, an introvert, and thinks this is living the dream. But It's, it's hard yards for a lot of people, and I'm grateful to them for making that kind of sacrifice. And I light this candle also for those joys and concerns in our hearts and minds that are unspoken. For my reading today, I know how much you've missed time for all ages. I'm not gonna show you a book, but I'm going to read you a story that somewhat Gary Kowalski uh, wrote as a time for all ages story, but I've adapted it some. Babies don't believe anything. Babies aren't born Buddhists or Baptists or believers of any sort. But soon after we arrive in the world, we start to gather ideas. 
we pick up beliefs and ideas about people and animals and families. We collect ideas about stars and comets and how it all got started. We accumulate beliefs about good and bad, right and wrong, what's healthy and unhealthy, and what is important in life. All these beliefs, which we get from our parents and playmates, from the TV and from Sunday school, go into our belief bag. Now, most religions define themselves by what they believe or by what's inside the bag. Christians believe in Jesus. Muslims believe in Allah and the prophet Muhammad. Buddhists believe in the Four Noble Truths. But Unitarian Universalists don't have just one set of beliefs. What makes us different is the way we Unitarian Universalists carry our beliefs. Because there, is, there are different ways of holding your belief bag. For example, some people clutch the bag close and make sure the top is tightly sealed because they don't want their beliefs exposed to any new ideas that could threaten what's inside. They've got their world wrapped up in a nice, tidy package. On the other hand, some people are just the opposite. They don't pay much attention at all to what goes into the bag. Well, one idea is as good as another. And if other folks believe it, or if they read it on the internet, or heard it on talk radio, or Fox News, or Donald Trump, then it must be true. And then there are people who carry their bags like a club. They use it to hit other people. What's inside their bag may sound very nice and sweet. For instance, I believe in peace and kindness and the golden rule, but they use their bag like a weapon. You don't believe in peace? Why you nasty person, shame on you. But none of those is the unitary. Unitarian Universalist way. Instead, we carry our bags with the top open so that new ideas and experiences can get inside and old beliefs can be tossed aside if needed. We carry our bags in front of us so we can see it exactly. Be sure it makes sense and fits with other things we know and also so that we can see what our neighbors think and share our thoughts with others. Above all, we never use our beliefs to beat up or bully other people. That's what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist. The next time somebody asks you, what do the people in your church believe? You could tell them, for Unitarian Universalists, it's less important what you believe than how you hold your beliefs. It's how you acquire them, how you share them, and above all, what you do with them that counts. Sometimes a children's time story sums it all up for us. I have a song I want to play for you. It's by an English family, mother, father, two boys, two girls. Only in this particular video, only the father and two girls are involved. They have done countless musical videos during lockdown in England, changing the words to old songs. Uh, and it, they're a delight. For your own amusement, and binge watching, if you go to YouTube and put in the Marsh family, you will get their full collection of uh, music videos. So if this doesn't work, you can go and uh, check it out later. Uh, and on the website with when Paul posts this service, that link will also be there. So this one is entitled, Have the New Jab, sung to the tune of Hallelujah. 
So let's see what happens. So my, the title for my talk this morning is Faith, Reason, and Conspiracy Theories. Ever since the pandemic began, the Ten Hat Brigade has been out in force, spreading misinformation and worse disinformation. The former is false information that people didn't create with the intention to hurt others. And the latter is false information created with the intention of harming a person, group, or organization, or even a country. They've always been around, but this time, thanks to social media, conspiracy theories have never been more deadly. I've seen videos of people in ICU dying of COVID still claiming it's a government hoax and that Bill Gates has put microchips in the vaccine to control us. It beggars belief. Up to now, I've dis just dismissed them without second thought, lumping them in with the few who believe in the Flat Earth Society and those who believe the moon lamb was a hoax spoon fed to the sheeple. But now their nonsense is threatening extinction. With the world increasingly on fire or underwater, their denouncing of climate change as not real and their undermining public health efforts to eliminate a deadly virus are a real threat. They have forced me to take them seriously and consider why people come up with conspiracy theories in the first place and why others are taken in by them when it isn't in their best interests. I'm gonna show you a, an opinion piece, a brief opinion piece on CNN regarding a conspiracy theorist in Congress who won a district with 75% of the vote. And she makes Trump sound rational. I am thoroughly sickened by what is happening in the country of my birth. I can barely make myself read or watch news from the US. It does make me thankful to live in Aotearoa, New Zealand, but I'm not complacent. While much of the disinformation originates in the Uni United States, like the COVID virus, it is spread globally. We are not immune. The polling firm Colmar Bruton surveyed a representative sample of 2,300 New Zealanders. It found that just about everyone is affected in some way. No one is immune to misinformation. You can't make assumptions about someone's vulnerability to misinformation based on things such as their age, gender, gender ethnicity, or other characteristics. It is simply not unusual for New Zealanders to believe in at least a few ideas that are linked to misinformation. And that's okay. However, at some stage, belief in misinformation becomes a problem. That stage is very hard to define, but often it connects with the point at which people start relying on false or misleading information to make important decisions that could affect their own health and safety or the safety of our community. About half of New Zealanders hold at least one belief associated with misinformation. Just under a third hold two or more beliefs, and just under a fifth hold three or more. Among these beliefs are COVID-19 and vaccine-related conspiracy theories, beliefs that 9-11 or March 15th terror attacks were hoaxes, and denial of the scientific consensus on climate change. People who have higher levels of trust in news or information from people they know personally and media 
or experts are more likely to be susceptible to misinformation. Those who use social media and trust it more as a source of information are also more likely to hold multiple of these beliefs. Sadly, the world has become a petri dish where people like Billy Te Kahika, a musician turned aspiring politician, flourish. He fronted packed meetings in town halls around New Zealand in 2020. He told the crowds COVID-19 was a conspiracy, a government takeover plot by the United Nations and a coterie of billionaires. He conjured visions of military enforced vaccination programs and shared dark theories about the health effects of 5G and fluoride. On the surface, conspiracy theories are rooted in the supposed conflict between faith and reason. On what level that is true? Simply look at who supports QAnon, a collection of conspiracy theories published online in the dark net that claims Donald Trump is waging a secret war against a worldwide cabal of Satan-worshipping pedophiles that conveniently for Republicans, mostly includes Democrats and progressives. The Economist asked Americans their racial and religious affiliations, whether they thought of QAnon favorably or unfavorably, and whether they believed in a variety of popular conspiracy theories. Americans who attended church the least are also the least likely to have a favorable view of QAnon. Adults who attended church at least once a month are eight percentage points more likely than predicted to rate QAnon favorably. White evangelicals, the most religiously devout group amongst those surveyed are particularly susceptible to supporting QAnon and believing other conspiracy theories. They also tend to, to attend church frequently. It's not enough that QAnon is busy corrupting Christian denominations. QAnon followers are forming a new religious movement. The Omega Kingdom Ministry, or OKM for short, has a two hour Sunday morning service. It's, it uses an existing model of neo-charismatic home churches, an offshoot of evangelical Protestant Christianity that is made up of thousands of independent organizations where QAnon conspiracy theories are reinterpreted through the Bible. In turn, QAnon conspiracy theories serve as a lens to interpret the Bible itself. Their objective is to train congregants to form their own home congregations in the future and grow the movement. On its website, OKM references the seven mountains of societal influence. Seven Mountains utilizes the language of dominionism, a theology that believes countries, including the United States, should be governed by Christian biblical law. Its goal is to attain socio-political and economic transformation through the gospel of Jesus and what it calls the seven mountains or spheres of society, religion, family, education, government, media, entertainment, and business. This blends QAnon's apocalyptic desire to destroy society controlled by the deep state with dominionist need for the kingdom of God on earth. As an antidote to the swamp of conspiracy theories perpetrated in the name of religion, we need to revisit the 11th century and listen to Anselm of Canterbury. Anselm thought deeply on the relationship between faith and reason. He concluded that faith is the precondition of knowledge. His Latin phrase was credo ut in 
I believe in no order. And he didn't despise it. In fact, he employed it in all his writing. He simply believed knowledge cannot lead to faith and knowledge gained outside of faith is untrustworthy. He highlighted that no knowledge is ever fully available to one who does not trust. Let me repeat that. No knowledge is ever fully available to the one who does not trust. This is why we can speak not simply of faith as a theological virtue, but also of faith as being natural, natural faith. As John Henry Newman pointed out, if we do not trust our senses or our intellects, we cannot even begin the process of knowing. Everything we know, or even think we know, we know by some combination of faith and reason. Christian faith is not, as it's sometimes asserted, blind. From the beginning, Christians have presented evidence for their claims. Consideration of this evidence might lead a person to believe or to doubt, but evidence is offered. No one is invited to believe without reference to some argument that belief is reasonable. But evidence does not compel belief. Instead, it makes the choice of where to put one's faith clear. Reason clears the ground for faith. Scientific knowledge is not, as is sometimes asserted, purely rational. Instead, it relies on certain unprovable, unproven or even unprovable presuppositions. Indeed, science only ever emerges in a culture that takes for granted things like the possibility of a true correspondence between the human mind and physical reality. Such natural faith does not do the work of science. It is the foundation that makes science possible. One reason why modern science emerged when and where it did in world history is precisely because medieval theologians had spent centuries considering, carefully considering, and, tar and articulating the roles of faith and reason in human knowing. Christian theology produced epistemological prerequisites for the development of science. It is not surprising then that Copernicus, Galileo, Newton, and Descartes were all people of strong faith. Faith will have a role in human knowing for good or ill, but that role is much more likely to lead to knowledge of the truth if it is acknowledged. At the root of conspiracy theory thinking is often precisely this refusal to acknowledge one's faith commitments. For instance, humanism is a faith commitment. But in conspiracy theory thinking, this takes on a kind of inverted form. The conspiracy theorist on your local media feed is at one and the same time, both the loudest in their assertion to be a critical thinker and also the least likely to have their mind changed by evidence. A critical thinker is skeptical of various claims made by all kinds of media it is healthy and necessary to double check claims, investigate sources, distinguish between facts and interpretation. This is what conspiracy theorists imagine themselves to be doing. In reality, however, the conspiracy theorist has crossed the line from healthy skepticism into unhealthy suspicion. This leads to the ironic situation, which they reflectively reject any and all facts that do not comport with their preconceived notions and accept almost any claims at all, even mutually contradictory claims, provided that those claims counter what they take to be the mainstream narrative. As a people of faith who hold reason paramount, Unitarians need to seek ways to turn this tide that threatens our families, societies, and the planet. But how? Entering into right 
mocking their beliefs will only entrench deeper those who have accepted conspiracy theories. Ignoring them, hoping they will go away, is magical thinking. We need to respect their human dignity and listen to them. Ask questions about their fears. Remain connected to them. And as hard as it may be, love them. On another level, we need to push social media platforms to do a better job weeding out both misinformation and disinformation. We need to respond on social media with accurate information when we encounter these weeds. It's unlikely to change the minds of those already committed to such thinking, but may influence those who have not yet made up their minds. Lastly, we must apply critical thinking to evaluate the misinformation we hold on to. For all of us do. Not a particularly joyful musing. And to capture that fact, let me play this. My words today for extinguishing the chalice. We extinguish this chalice flame, daring to care for the vision of this free faith, that freedom, reason, and justice will one day prevail in this nation and across the earth. My closing words. If you are who you were, if none of us has changed, we have failed. The purpose of this community, of any church, temple, zendo, mosque, is to help people grow. We do this through encounters with the unknown, in ourselves and one, in one another. In the other, whoever that might be for us, however hard that might be. Because these encounters have many gifts to offer. So may you go forth from here this morning, not who you were, but who you could be. So may we all. And now I'm going to send you off into uh, small groups, and here's your con conversation start. I saw on Facebook a quote by Abraham Lincoln who said, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Have you ever accepted misinformation as true and passed it on? Be specific if you can. I want to thank you all for engaging today. Um, I have a video for those who want to hang in there. Mm -hmm. It's by John Oliver on uh, his show that he does on HBO. 
about <laughs> conspiracy theories mm. if you want to be entertained. Now, I need to warn you, like many comedians, he uses some rough language. So if you're easily offended, you're probably not a Unitarian, but you can, uh, I want to at least warn you. Uh, and uh, so feel free, but this is the official close of the service. And we'll see you next week.